Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being here. So we're going to have just kind of an informal conversation, and then hopefully you know, we can make this interactive and, and have conversations with everyone here as Perfect. well. Okay. Um, but you know, many of you were probably in the last Perfect. session, and, and I introduced myself. But just in case um, you weren't, I'm Chris, uh, father to Hans, who has PBD and turns five next week. And we're coming from central Illinois, but recently we were in St. Louis, which is where we met uh, Dr. Draper at, at Cardinal Glennon there in St. Louis. Um, so we wanted to just kind of have a little conversation about palliative care, um, and particularly kind of, I'm you know, happy to share some of our experiences with palliative care. Um, and then with, with the hope being that, you know, maybe those of you who have not established care with palliative care, um, yet, you know, this might be something that, you know, leads you to have that conversation with your, your specialist, your pediatrician. Because um, I do think that palliative care has been really, really helpful for, for our son and, and for our family in navigating this diagnosis. So, um, Dr. Draper, could you just share a little bit about palliative care, like what it is and what it isn't? Um, you know, pediatric palliative care is... Um, Often, uh, oftentimes in the adult world, palliative care is synonymous with hospice and end of life care. And that definition often extends to pediatric providers. So that is definitely a portion of what we do. But I think that the bigger circle of what pediatric palliative care is, is this extra layer of support for families with life threatening or life limiting conditions, is how we kind of define it. So when we say, like, who can get a referral to palliative care, that's how we think about it in our hospital. And then we think about it in terms of what does that child and what does that family need from a supportive standpoint. Sometimes that is very medically focused as far as supportive care, as far as symptoms like pain, nausea. Some of it's because our treatments cause it. Sometimes it's because of the disease process itself. So we can think about it from that standpoint. But then we also think about it and how do we tie all these individual strings together. You know how many specialists you have in your children's life. You know how many medical providers, phone numbers to call. Who is who's the next person to call? So I think about somebody that kind of tries to tie all that up, but ties it up in context of your child and your family. Um, it's forming a relationship for whatever trajectory your child may be on, is to have that relationship basis to say what's most important. What's most important for Hans? and his parents and his sister as we make big decisions as they come up. Even if we can't anticipate what those decisions are, then, but we still have a context to help make them. Or if we can anticipate what decisions may be coming, having that conversation before they're right in front of us so it doesn't feel so emergent. Yeah, and just to share a little bit about our journey with, with palliative care. So, so Hans was diagnosed at, uh, at three months old um, but, you know, in the first, I would say, year to 18 months of his life, there wasn't a whole lot medically going on. I mean, once we got the diagnosis and we were connected with the GFPD, um, we really knew a lot of the specialists to establish care with, you know, to be proactive to the extent possible. Um, and so we were setting up all these specialists and it was becoming more and more difficult to kind of coordinate all of that and manage all of the appointments and, and things like that. Um, and when we were at Cardinal Glennon, they had a, a complex care clinic, which many of you know the institutions where you're at might have that. So we, we established, you know, we sort of became a part of that complex care clinic, and they really helped with the coordination and um, kind of the behind the scenes, you know, and then coming together every three or six months to kind of have, you know, a holistic view of like ponds right now. And, and that was really helpful because that's kind of what we needed at that time. But it was also around that time, like a year to, to 18 months, um, that as the disease progressed a little bit, and especially towards 18 months when he was having, the, the hearing loss had progressed more, and we were starting to think maybe about cochlear implants. And then also, that's when a lot of the feeding issues came with the G-tube. And then, you know, I mentioned in the last session, this is kind of around the time when some of the GI and, and bleeding issues started to to peek their head a little bit. And it was it was around that time that we were really, like we needed more support. And, and that's where, um, I, I think it was our pediatrician who, who made the referral to Dr. Draper and her team. And they really, you know, I, I remember, you know, one of the first kind of conversations about Hans that we had was thinking about the cochlear implant. And um, we had gotten, 
a, um, I think it was a, a head CT done to kind of look, you know, from a surgical perspective, and, and they realized that Hans had some abnormal craniofacial anatomy that would have made the surgery a little bit more complicated, a little bit longer, and then that combined with some of the bleeding concerns that were showing up, um, you know, the idea to, to implant didn't, wasn't so clear cut. And I remember kind of, you know, Rachel and I, and, you know, talking with, with Dr. Greenberg and her team, and, um, you know, that was kind of one of those first sort of big picture conversations we had. And, and since that time, you know, palliative care has really helped us kind of, you know, take in all of the, the very particular conversations and questions that, that we're engaging with our specialists about, but then always like zooming out and taking in the full picture. And, and not just the picture of, of Hans, but really the picture of our family as well. Um, I don't know if you have anything else. It's kind of interesting. We think about um, physicians being very good at having honest conversations, and it is a skill set to be learned. It's not always going to come naturally to physicians. And Dr. Labarge, their pediatrician, said, I, I think you need to meet this family. First, you're going to love them, and second, I think they need you. And at the same, like, kind of simultaneously, the ENT surgeon came to me. He's like, I just, I don't know. I, I'm afraid that he could die if we did this or we could get this infection. But I'm like, well, he told me. Well, he's like, no. And I was like, well, probably we need to start with that. Um, and just helping, sometimes a palliative care tool is really in the background to try to see what are, what are our risks of this? What, is, what are our next steps? And then how do we put that in terms for the family? Because, you know, Rachel, you play piano, and that's what you told me. You're like, this is what I love to do for Hans, and this is what calms him. So we had to weigh, we weigh risk and benefits differently with our children um, in, in all of these different contextual features, and you can't make decisions as a parent if you don't have all the information. So sometimes it's palliative care's role really to make sure all that information is distilled down to make, to make sure that it gets to you so that you can make the best choice for your family. And then you're supported in that choice. Because I also have found that a lot of parents feel like if they don't make the choice that that specialist is recommending, that it's like, well, fine, whatever, you didn't follow what we needed. And it may not be what's right for you and your family. So I think having that support, whichever path you go down, is really important too. Yeah, I think along those lines, you know, um, I also see from, from an advocacy standpoint, palliative care has been really helpful. Um, and, and again, sometimes advocating kind of behind the scenes. Um, and I think, I think back to when Hans's GI bleeds first started and um, before we had placed the port, whenever we were talking about placing the port. And uh, we were inpatient and he was on the, the GI team because of the bleeds. And it was, a, it, was, it was a doctor who I don't think had seen Hans before, um, but just kind of, you know, looking over the chart and everything. And, and there was kind of a, a conversation that he initiated around, okay, so you're interested in doing a port, but you understand that we probably can't fix the cause of bleeding. And it was sort of implied like, okay, like, is this really the path you want to go down? And, and I think palliative care really kind of helped us um, advocate, like, you know, again, thinking back to like, the risks and benefits, you know, like, let's, let's give him the blood transfusions if, if he's doing well with them, and if, and, and again, knock on, you know, knock on wood, Hans has handled them well. Um, but, but again, I think that, you know, as, as many of you probably have in, in your own experiences, I think sometimes, you know, someone might look at a diagnosis like a PBD, and there are certain, um, certain assumptions about what life will look like or has to look like, and it's difficult to kind of think outside of that box. And, and I think that you know, Dr. Draper and her team, they've, they've always really helped us have the mindset, and, and more importantly, our, our providers, our other care team, have the mindset that, that Hans is really writing his own story, and we're sort of taking the lead from him. Um, and, 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 it, and it does require that ongoing relationship because the disease is progressive and circumstances do change. Um, but by developing that relationship with, with Dr. Draper and her team early, we've kind of been able to, to have those big picture conversations throughout um, and, and acknowledging when, when goals might change, you know. It's really important to think about what palliative care is not. Um, we also are not, oh, we're doing palliative care. We're not doing other therapies. 
Like, first of all, palliative care is therapy. You know, we're going to treat these symptoms. We're going to, you know, offer this level of support. But it doesn't exclude all of the other aggressive or not aggressive measures that may be right for your child. And I think that's a big fear of a lot of families of if we, we don't want to give a signal that we don't want all of the things offered. Or, you know, we want to still have that decision making for our families. And even on hospice, we have families that still choose relatively aggressive supportive care measures of children that are on hospice. So it doesn't, um, and some of that from an advocacy standpoint is to continue to advocate for the ability to provide concurrent care on Medicaid or in Medicaid, is that we, if we can provide the therapies, like blood transfusions and things like that, and still provide hospice, if, that's, if that time comes, it's really important to be able to provide that concurrent care and allow families to have the support early on and not exclude whether it's a clinical trial or it's aggressive therapies. All of those things are still on the table and I think that's a big fear to exclude. Now we can say with Hamza's journey, we had at times been you know, worried that the trajectory was going to be different than it has been and then he does rise. He surprises us every single day. Um, and I love that. And I love that we can have some really serious conversations and think the next few months may look different. And then he, you know, he, he surprises us and it's <coughs> different. And then we, we change up what we're doing um, based on what he needs. Yeah, and one of the things that I think about related to the, the last session about the, when I shared about the blood transfusions, um, and this is a conversation that we've had, you know, because Hans has been dependent on the blood transfusions for so often. and. You know, there were times in that year or 18 months where he was needing it weekly, sometimes a little bit more than weekly, sometimes five days. And I remember having conversations with, with Dr. Draper and her team about, okay, so, so you know, okay, we wish it wasn't every week, but, you know, we got this. But, uh, I mean, a blood transfusion, it's, it's a day out in the clinic. And, and, and Hans, because of his the chronic anemia, because he was dropping so quickly, he was really lethargic and sleepy sort of in between. So we, we, we had those conversations about, okay, what if, what if it goes from a week to five days, and then to three days, and then every other day? Like, like where, where, is that, where is that line? Is there a line? And it, it's a conversation that I wish we didn't have to have, and I wish that, that our families don't have to have conversations like that. But I think that, as many of us know, when we're, um, when you're facing a complex diagnosis that requires chronic interventions, um, it can be really difficult to be able to sort of step back and look at those, look at the effect that it has on the child, on the family, because we sort of, we adjust and we get used to these new normals, right? Um, but I do think that it's really important to always keep, you know, our kids and, and our, our loved ones who are affected by this diagnosis to keep them in, in, in the forefront of mind. And, um, and it's, it's, it's helpful to have a team um, like Dr. Draper or her team or, or a specialist like a palliative care specialist because as a parent it's really difficult to initiate and to have those conversations because we don't want to think about that, we want to think about doing everything. Um, but sometimes we need to think about, okay, is there, is there going to be a time where we might draw a line or is there a certain intervention that we might not do? Um, and I think about some of the code status conversations we've had um, with Dr. Draper and her team around when Hans was having um, really difficult, when we had difficulty handling his seizures and he was having a lot of central apnea and we had um, a few scares with, with rescue meds and EMS, and, and having conversations about like what what do we do if he just doesn't start breathing again on his own? Do we do chest compressions? Do we, you know, or do or don't we? And and for us, our answer to that has changed over time, as as I think many of you all can can appreciate and understand. And um, it's been helpful to have the conversation with the same the, the same team, you know, rather than starting that. What's nice too about having those conversations is sometimes we provide that translation to, you know, I remember one time the ICU doctor called and was like, what are we doing with Hans? You know, he had had a bleed, he was stable, but there was concern that maybe he wasn't going to be stable over the next 12 to 24 hours. And I'm like, here's the context of the conversations here. Here's what's important to know. And so it became, the ICU was able to breathe a little bit easier with some of those conversations that happened. And all, um, 
you know, I would be remiss to say that end of life and hospice care isn't a part of what we do, and some of it is code conversations. Um, and to have that as it changes, because we think about children with complex diagnoses with chronic health conditions, you know, they have a baseline, and then they have an acute decline. Maybe it's from just a relatively mild illness, and they come back up to that baseline. But there's a lot of times we establish a new baseline. And the answer to the same exact questions may be different at this new baseline. And we are able to kind of track, like, what does that trajectory look like over time? Is it starting to speed up? And maybe, re like, pointing that out to parents. Like, say, you know what? The first two years that I knew you, you were in the hospital every other, every six months. Now it seems like every other month you're here. Um, so it seems like your journey is progressing at a faster rate now. And to be able to look at that picture and say, you know what? We did talk about that, but maybe it looks differently now. Um, and to be able to facilitate that conversation, and, but not have to do it every time. The other thing that I found is that families don't want to talk about that all the time. You want to know that you have thought about it and that somebody is there with you, that presence, to know that you're not alone in making those decisions, but that you also just want to talk about, guess what you did yesterday? It's really amazing. Um, and to be able to have both sides of those conversations is important. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, there's, there's probably different models depending on where, you know, the, your home institution is, but um, and at Cardinal Glennon, like Lauren and her team will they'll sort of pop in whenever we're, we're there for other things, other visits, often blood transfusions because that's been his most frequent touch point by far. And, and I think that it's really been a good, it's been good for us because it sort of takes the anxiety around, you know, having these dis, dis, discrete palliative care conversations Instead, it's like we're, we're building this relationship over time with them all the time. And, and you know, Dr. Draper's right. Like, sometimes it's, it's telling Hans about his, his girlfriend, Gwendolyn, who's here. Um, yeah. Um, or, or about, you know, what he did, you know, uh, yesterday or the week before. Um, but then also those times that it's, it's the more difficult conversations. It's the, okay, he's had, you know, four inpatient stays in the last two months. You know what's going on here. Let's let's talk about this. Um, another thing that I think of that, that happened recently, and this is I think somewhat related to the, the advocacy piece. Uh, we so we recently moved to Central Illinois, and there's another children's hospital that's a little bit closer to us than than in St. Louis, and so they don't have a lot of context for Hans. They haven't had the history with Hans, and we were inpatient um, for. I think it was a cold, Rachel, right before Christmas. Was it a cold? Anyway, he had, it might have just been rhinoenteral, but it really affects Hans like it does many of our kiddos. But we were inpatient right before Christmas, and he was on high flow for a few days, and then as we were getting closer and closer to Christmas, you know, we were thinking like, okay, we really need to get out of here because we don't want to spend Christmas, you know, yet another holiday in the hospital. And, but, but the team, you know, in, in, the, in the intermediate care unit, they were really hesitant to send Hans home because, again, they didn't know Hans. And here they see this kid, they look through his, his, you know, huge medical chart, and they see that he was just now kind of getting weaned off high flow. And they're like, we really want to keep him all weekend and, you know, and just be safe. And, and we were able to work with, with the palliative care team at that, at that new hospital um, to really, help the attending understand that being home as a family on Christmas was a really important goal for us. And yes, Hans is, is sick, but we know him well, and we like where he's headed clinically, and we have lots of supports like oxygen and other things at home. Um, but sometimes it, it's hard for the attending or a clinician who doesn't have a lot of context about our kiddos to see um, and they, they don't want to send a child home that they're maybe not super comfortable with. But in working with palliative care, we were able to, to advocate and, and to come home. Um, and it was important for us. And, and that's you know, just another way that palliative care has helped our family. I don't know. Do we want to give, if you all have questions, I want to be able to, I don't know what time it is, if close. But yes. I 
I think so. I think any, um, any child, young adult that has a chronic, life-threatening, life-limiting condition would benefit from palliative care team. It is a little bit different access as far as from an adult side versus a pediatric side. Is she primarily followed at an adult institution now? Well, she is. I mean, there are certain things that they've done, like pediatric audiology, and, um, you know, I shot my was quite five, but it isn't to put her back into you know, the case. It would be a hundred and twenty bar, only because of the pediatric event. Seems like the pediatrician has to know more, or more willing to, to work with her than you know, people who are working on it. Right. It sounds like a palliative care consult would be absolutely appropriate. So I would start with, you know, just asking, you know, who you identify as her, whether, you know, her primary care or, yeah, exactly. Just saying, what services, what can we access here? And then I think it's worth pushing a board. And sometimes that is, can we, if they don't have it, can we call the children's hospital that she went to and see if they would still at least do a consult with us to help direct us on our next steps? Because um, I do think it provides that layer of support, and like you're saying, the pain management, all of those sort of things. Yeah, just to make sure that she can hear and that everything's going to work well. Fears about palliative care. Oh, yeah. 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 If I need to, I'm just going to laugh at here. If I can hear her, and it doesn't I also just wanted to add on to the relationship that we have established with Dr. Draper. So. Whenever I, we've gone to a lot of these meetups and conferences, I would have parents telling me, well, we got a diagnosis, but the doctor said, oh, well, you're going to die within the next year, so what do you want to do? And to me, that's just very shocking that they would say things like that. And, you know, it's just not something that parents want to hear. You know, it's just, the relationship that we have with Laura, and she's advocated for us, and you know, anything new with Hans, she is our first consult, and it really gives us that comfort to know that we're doing absolutely everything we can with the support of a physician for Hans, for his comfort, for his well-being. And so we are very strong advocates for palliative care just because we have seen how amazing it's been for Hans and for our family and for our happiness. And we just think that everybody, everybody needs palliative care. <laughs> that is horrifying to think about parents being told that. Um, I, I can't imagine having that conversation. And I, I, I can't imagine that a lot of parents probably feel that their child is written off. Um, and I think that is what we fight for each one of our children in palliative care that they're not. And I'm not saying that's across the board. I'm saying sometimes it's out of fear and just not knowing about the disease process and not knowing. Um, but it feels like your child isn't getting all of the things offered to them that they should. Um, and that's, that's wrong. I mean, we've got to have conversations about what's right for each child, is my thought. Any other questions or comments or? Chris, I have one because both of you, your background in, in healthcare and, and, and palliative care, you know, many of our, and you mentioned this in the earlier video, um, can you give people advice about, you know, there, there's always the fights with the insurance companies, the hospital systems, et cetera. You know, how can our families best advocate in the most professional way to get the best out of their medical? Um, so I have, interestingly, I, I have a primary immune deficiency, so I have my entire life learned that my family has fought with insurance companies forever to get what I've needed. Um, and I just thought that was kind of normal, and then uh, lo and behold, it's not. But it is for anybody with a chronic disease. So I think that I had that background coming into it, so I see it as often my job to figure out who is the best person. So if it is for factor, then it is our hematology team because they know the words that the insurance company is going to need. So I think it's identifying somebody that can say, who's the person that does this? And then you pester them. That, that is, I mean, I know that sounds like bad advice, but that's kind of all that I know the best to do. 
Yeah, and I'll say that, you know, I think that, again, with palliative care, kind of with the, the focus being the whole person and really the whole family, that's where, you know, as particular issues come up where you're trying to get a particular medication or a certain test or a certain therapy, palliative care can sort of be that point of entry where they, if they can't help specifically, they can help advocate on the inside to get it done. Um, because that is the hardest thing, like, as, as you all know, I mean, just navigating the health system is is very difficult and, and insurance and, and all of that and as if we don't have other things on our plate already. The last thing we want to do is, is argue with the bill or uh, something not being covered. Um, so I think that it really does, it is important to have those advocates sort of inside the system, you know, on your care team that care about your child and your family. Um, and for us that's very much been palliative care. And, and I know, you know, for those who, who do or don't have palliative care, it might be a different subspecialist, or maybe it's their primary care uh, clinician. But I think just having that, that person that you just go to first is really, really important and really helpful um, because it's something we can't do on our own. Thank you, Dr. Draper, for your time and, and for you all for 